hopefully that will work. Um, so let's talk about our speaker. We have today Andrew Smith. He is a change leader, agilist, a technical professional who specializes in enabling agility through culture, process, technology, and leadership. I also have to say he's a great friend and an awesome coach. Um, love the fact that he's here speaking with us today. And I'm going to turn it directly over to him. All right. Thank you, Ken. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Princeton Agility, for, for hosting. Um, I'm going to start with a little icebreaker, uh, get you talking with each other. Uh, Ken, I think we'll do the two, two for all. I'm going to put on uh, a little bit of instruction on the screen first. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to go into breakouts. And there's three questions I'd like you to answer. I will paste these questions in. And the way we're going to do this is what's called two for all. So initially, we in pairs, chat about these questions, learn something about each other. And then Ken's going to combine you into groups of four. And you'll have a few more minutes to chat, see if anything else comes out. Uh, and then when you come back, I'm, I'm going to ask you to share back what's something you learned. Uh, what was your experience in that conversation? And how might you apply what you learned? So any questions or what questions do you have before we send you to the breakouts? Can you let me know when they're ready in pairs? I have them in pairs. Um, wow. I'm leaving the co-hosts out for now, or should I include the co-hosts? Uh, you can I'll, leave, the I'll leave the co-hosts co out for now. All right. We'll let them optionally join. How's that? Sounds great. All right. Shall we? Shall we begin? What questions do people have? No questions, I guess. Hearing none. Breakouts away. Yep. Probably pause recording while we're in breakouts. I see there's a button. I can do that. All right. Welcome back. So what's something new that you learned? I learned about Euchre, a new card game, which I never played before. <laughs> awesome. So. What what game is that? Um, e uh, Euchre? A Gaddy plays that. <laughs> yeah, so. Euchre, it's a card game. It's a four-player card game. They play it a lot in the Midwest. That's, that's funny. I, I grew up playing Euchre with my grandmother and great-grandmother uh, in Australia. So, <laughs> yes. All right, what's something else somebody learned? We never got past what's the, what's the biggest problem, <laughs> you know, with first question. So it, it's interesting, though. I mean, uh, we felt the biggest, Dave, please, please uh, correct me here or add to what I'm saying. But the biggest question was, you know, not being on the same page with the business and needing feeling we'd need an agile transformation coach on most projects, or if not all because they're thinking in waterfall terms and they're expect, you know, seeing in longer term perspective and they're expecting specificity from us from those terms and not thinking in agile terms. And so we never seem quite in sync with business, business sponsors and higher level managers. And they're not, and they're not thinking of it in terms of the, the, an agile project moving forward, an individual agile, pro, agile project, let alone a portfolio of agile projects that have to be, get, be set kept in sync moving forward in stages and sprints and releases. So they're thinking of it in long-term, you know, and applying, you know, expecting specificity, even in long-term projections from an agile group, agile team. But in the meantime, they don't, they don't apply that same standard to themselves when they're looking at longer term projections for finding financial budgets, whatever, you know, but so there's, there's this disconnect. And it, it fleshes out in requirements too. What features do they, are they expecting when? Well, yeah. a year out, we can't say that for spe with specificity because we don't know what we're going to run into. You know, 
I mean, you build, and what I've seen personally is that, you know, you build requirements, it's happened in waterfall and in agile, you build requirements, they start seeing what's what's coming, and then they say, oh, that's not what we meant. Well, you you know, they approve well, so the requirements. This is, this is a great lead-in, Paul, actually, to some of where we're going. So uh, one of my hopes is, is that you actually walk away with some tools that have a conversation. Uh, good, good, yeah, great. Thank you, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, um, is is there anybody else who learned something that they feel really compelled to share in this moment? Udif and I, we were just talking about um, what the biggest uh, risk is uh, in terms of like product development. So we were both on the same page um, um, and uh, we both thought that creating a product and not having a market for it, that's like the biggest risk possible. You spend all the money and not, um, eventually recouping that. And then um, also one of the ways to monitor the risk was uh, we again agreed on that. So just to, uh, to get frequent uh, frequent feedback. Um, so those are the two things we talked about. And we both don't play card, card games, but you know, but he mentioned Uno. I know how to play Uno. So <laughs> like, awesome. <laughs> we use our wild cards as much as we can. <laughs> and it relates to uh, project management as well. Sometimes you do have to use those uh, wild cards to. I, I know. I I, to... yeah, I I want a deck of those to use uh, using <laughs> yes. our programs too. Yes, definitely. All right, so let's move on. We we've got some some fun to have today. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, Ken gave the very brief intro, but but I am Andrew Smith. I have spent more than thirty years in systems and software development. Uh, I've worn many hats over the years. I've been the software lead, project lead, principal architect, product owner, scrum master, agile coach, engineering manager, and probably a bunch of other things. Uh, I'm currently senior product manager, enterprise agility at Starbucks. Uh, standard Starbucks disclaimer, my opinions are mine and may not reflect what Starbucks thinks. Uh, but what I do is I teach, I curate learning uh, around the topics of agility and product management. And I also consult, coach, and facilitate. Here's the bad news. Your theories about what will be successful in a product are wrong. How wrong are they? According to Clayton Christensen, uh, a researcher at Harvard, uh, nearly 30,000 products are introduced each year. And I believe this research is several years old, so that number is probably small. And 95% of them fail. That's a lot of wrong. And this only counts products that were actually introduced. What about product development efforts that were started and discontinued before they even re reached the market? Um, I was actually part of a program once a number of years ago where we spent $40 million in VC money before the project was abandoned. That was pretty expensive. So I'd like to hear from you. Uh, I, I've heard a couple of good answers here. Why, why do products fail either before or after la launch? One I heard was when we don't have a market, but uh, another is we don't have alignment on what we're building. What are some other answers that you have? Sometimes timing could be not right. Uh, you could, you your product might be perfect at the perfect time. Uh, so for example, like a virtual sharing platform would have been much better when like when the pandemic hit, uh, like it was, it was a good time to take off uh, and it had a good market. Um, probably if it was much earlier, it couldn't have such a good market during that time. Uh, like the virtual video sharing platforms and all these uh, that we use right now. So timing, I think, is pretty good. Uh, the Zoom that we're using right now, great example, right? Yes. Yeah. What else? 
But an inadequate or infrequent communication between product sponsors and product in product teams and back to uh, so that it's clear from what the business wants to what's being communicated to product management, product owner, et cetera, to the development team and back so that the, the business side is seeing what's being developed frequently enough to be able to say before it gets off track, yeah, that that we're so that we're everybody in, involved is in sync and saying, yeah, we're moving in the direction we all want to be moving in. And if that's not happening clearly enough and frequently enough, there's going to be a failure. So Andrew, you mentioned you yes. mentioned uh, statistics about products failing even before it reaches the market. Uh, what was that number? Uh, well, that, that number was uh, products after they reached the market. Uh, I don't know that anybody's attempted to count, and if they have, I don't have the answer. Uh, but I've been certainly been part of product developments that that were abandoned before they hit the market. So. One one other thing uh, that can go wrong is we um, go too long without getting feedback. So we build work in, in too big of a uh, unit before we get feedback on it. Yeah. I also think sometimes, um, and I was discussing this with uh, my partner in the um, in our group chat in our um, in a breakout room that sometimes we uh, take our vision too far, and sometimes the product might be too futuristic and the market is not ready for it even though they might have wanted something like that so it ends up to be very expensive right yeah the market not ready and perhaps the technology not ready what else yeah i've seen situations where um how people actually use the product are ignored over what people's original intent for the product are, which kills a lot of opportunity. Yeah, we're not we're not finding out what what's actually needed. And uh, Anna has posted in the chat, not a clear requirement or gaps in the requirements. So uh, uh, and, and one way we might think about that is the you know, the gap between either what was intended, what was actually built, which is getting to Paul's point of a gap between business and, and engineering perhaps, and then not understanding whether we're meeting a customer need. Yep. One uh, other place, go ahead, yeah. Th there could also be something like competitive pressure where your product just isn't good enough compared to a competitor and that might cause you to fail. Indeed. So this, this chart is the technology adoption life cycle from uh, Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. And it's very much about how uh, new innovations get adopted. It gives us a place to look. Uh, when, when we think about this, uh, Aparajita, if I've got your name right, uh, mentioned you know, market not ready. You know, we're, we're ahead of the market. Uh, what are some other thoughts that this chart suggests around why products fail? I'm thinking about like insufficient marketing, number one, like marketing to the wrong people. Right. And um, the impact of not targeting the folks that would be interested in innovating and adopting in an early way. Mm, so if I've got something new, maybe I'm not reaching the innovators first and the, the early majority is not going to follow unless they see uh, success in the early adopters. And I see wrong targeted audience here in the chat as well. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, you can also have for a cheaper substitute product. So if somebody comes out and, and can solve the same problem more cheaply, uh, they might steal my market, right? So my product's been, been introduced, it started to be successful, but now it fails. 
I, I think that's where you were going with it. Yeah, that's what I was going to go. Yeah, cool. All right, let's 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 flip over to the other side now. What are some things that make products successful? Marketing. So actually getting the word out, reaching people. Yeah, what else? Sound research for the product. What's the intent of the product? Like basically doing um, before you launch or even start making the product, um, creating a good, um, in Agile, they would say backlog or even um, user stories um, to see what the need is before we start developing it. Um, and if there is a clear vision, then the product will be successful. A clear vision that meets a need. There's a point of where we're going. Yes. What else? Is, um, jobs to be done. Like, are we are we actually fulfilling a need that the customer has? Uh, does it help them <clears throat> with with something that they need to do? To, does it help them do it faster or better or 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 something that they couldn't even do today? Yeah, and I also see user-friendly, accurate assessments of the market competitors, uh, products which solve a problem. So these are great lead-ins to what you have probably seen before, thinking about a product as desirable, viable, and feasible, the innovation sweet spot. So desirable, does it solve a real problem that somebody has? Uh, you know, does it actually fill a need? Is it, is it valuable to them? Uh, is it usable? This is where we get the usability. Um, feasibility, can we actually do it? A lot of product development uh, that we never see fails because something, uh, it, we actually couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> I, I, a long time ago, I worked for a long distance phone company. And uh, the, one of the ways they made a lot of money was actually what was called operator services. So uh, some some of us are showing our age if we nod around what that was. Um, but the the interesting thing is they they solved a particular problem, and then at one point, you know, we we could actually make more money if we could uh, get the call routed to the operator even faster. And and the project lead for for that particular thing turned turned around and said, yeah. I, I think we could do that in about 20 years and a few billion dollars because we'd have to invent time travel in order to know in advance of when the call came in that it was coming in. Uh, so there's an example of, of feasible. And then viable. A viable product is one that we could sustainably do. So this gets to the point of um, you know, if, if there's market pressure and we can't make enough money on it, it's not viable for us. If, uh, yeah, we can do that, but it's going to cost us a billion dollars a month in cloud costs to do it, and we're not going to make that much money, that's not viable either. Uh, so the viability is, is, can we do it sustainably uh, in a commercial economic way? And uh, there, are, there are lots of great uh, comments in the chat here. You know, product price comes into the uh, both of those aspects, you know, is, is the price both desirable for the end user or the customer, uh, but also viable for us as a supplier. Uh, and if you've been around, uh, there's, there's a lot now in sort of that ethical space as well. So not just desirable, feasible and viable, but just because we can, should we? Uh, and uh, we've noticed a lot of commentary in the news about generative AI. So, if your theories are wrong about what a product might be for success, and we've got lots of ideas for success, but particular product success, where might we look? Well, here's some places we might look. One is... Can we, can we find out what assumptions we're making about whether our product is desirable, feasible, ethical, and viable? 
what would have to be true and remain true for this to be successful? So here's where we're going. We're going to send you back to the breakout. It's going to be groups of three to four. There's going to be an activity in Miro. So I am going to put some instructions and the link to the Miro in the chat. And before I send you there, I'm going to show you what you're going to do. So you'll have a Miro board uh, that looks like this. And depending on what breakout room you're in, Zoom shows you at the top of the screen somewhere what breakout room you're in. Find the frame. You'll see the frame label here, breakout one, breakout two. And then your first task is choose a product and write down in your first sticky product or product idea that you want to use as your example here. Now, it might be something you're working on. It might be something you come up with as a group. You might choose one of these examples. I've, I've thrown some both uh, ordinary and some outrageous examples in there. And then what you're going to do is put some stickies in here, asking those questions uh, through those lenses. Well, what risks? Where could we be wrong? What could go wrong? What could go wrong with our ideas about how feasible this is or how desirable it is or how ethical or viable? So put some stickies in, add your own notes, uh, with your risks, your assumptions, your hypotheses. What questions do you have before you, we send you into the breakouts? If you find that there are challenges using uh, Miro as an individual, as a person who's trying to use this stuff, um, you know, work with each other. Like if you, if one person can't get a stickies entered, um, I hope somebody else will step in and, and help them out. Yeah, kind of thing. somebody in your group could could uh, volunteer to be the scribe. And, and if uh, visibility is an issue, maybe reading the stickies back out as they appear. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with the co-host's permission, I'd like to add the co-hosts actually these breakout rooms as well. So Fernando, Natalie, Andrea, I'm going to add you folks to rooms. So that's okay. Sure. And mm -hmm. how much time do we have for this exercise? That seems a huge task. Uh, so you're going to have roughly six. We could extend it to maybe 10. Um, why don't we say 10 minutes in the breakout? And uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be complete. It, it's OK mm -hmm. if it feels incomplete and messy. The, the goal here is to get some practice in using these lenses and thinking about those questions. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna not do automatic breakout rooms after 10 minutes. I'm assuming that we'll just check in and then I'll broadcast a message about a minute before. Sounds good. All right. All right, away you go. Yep, thanks. Man. That's the sound of somebody who's pulled out of an interesting conversation. Oh yeah. <laughs> so my my dastardly plan worked. <laughs> but not in the way that you think. <laughs> Sorry about that, Andrew. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Um I'd like to hear from a couple of people. What was something you came up with? So our room number four, we picked the product uh, flying EV. Anyone else picked that product, guys? Oh, we no. were about to. Yeah, okay. we, we, we picked that. We scaled well. down. And we did. So we really liked uh, this product. There were certain benefits of uh, proceeding with this idea, but we also identified ethical risks and some other risks um do you want to hear what they were yeah just give us just give a sampling uh -huh. gary maybe you can go uh 
and describe those? Uh, I can go. Uh-huh. Thank you. Okay. Um, not sure what I mean, but um, like for desirable, might alleviate traffic on roads, would save us time. Uh, under feasible, like we might be able to use existing EV charging infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> um, we had a question of whether we can manufacture the personal flying vehicles cheap enough. Um, viable. <clears throat> um, do we have enough air traffic control for personal vehicles? And um, we think we would need new traffic rules to support safe transport. And then on the ethical side, um, we came up with might harm might we harm birds and other flying animals? Might it be a privacy or security risk? Might it be a safety risk? And would it widen the wealth gap or otherwise be inequitable? That's what we came up with. Wow. Yeah, you yeah. Quite a sampling. Um so zooming out from the specific risks and assumptions, what was useful about using desirable, feasible, viable, ethical as a lens? Well, I'm a big fan of um, like Teresa Torres and Opportunity Solution Trees. And one of the things that that technique does is it take, it makes very explicit the assumptions that we're making. And this this did that as well. Like these are the things that have to be true, and like if we truly want to be agile and and quick about like the quicker we can figure out whether the assumptions are true or not, especially the critical ones, the more likely we are to either have a successful product or not waste all of our time working on one that's never going to work. I liked about this uh, approach most, what I like uh, was that we were limited by only this few minutes that we had. And we had to come up with some ideas for all four aspects in just maybe five minutes or less. I think it would be great to practice something like this in a corporate meeting where things can be discussed months over months over months. <laughs> Yeah, that is funny. All right. So somebody else, what was useful or not useful about the desirable, viable, feasible, ethical lens? Mm -hmm. yes, you Gary. mean from, from our room or from no, other from, rooms? From from any of the rooms. So any of the rooms. What what was something useful or not useful about using that lens? Although we let ourselves get off track with a fascinating conversation, though, what was useful was, you know, looking at it and saying, uh, exploring the hypothetical and then and then and then looking at it and saying, OK, we've taken that big picture and let's narrow it down and say what, it, what you know, what's realistic, you know, what is feasible. And that that part we did, you know, and if you uh, and something things touched on the others as well. But it's good to take that picture, too, and say that hypothetical view and say, okay, we quickly enough ruled out some of these other things, you know, and that's where we, that's where we, we veered off course, but it's still a good place to start, I think. All right. Any, anybody else? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was about to say that you can summarize what we discussed. We didn't have the third person again. Um, oh no no! I was going to talk about what, what was useful uh, um, for me okay. is that it takes people out of their their own bubbles. Because when you discuss with marketing people, they talk about what they think the market wants, but they forget about all of the other aspects. Is it viable? Is it feasible? And when you talk talk to engineers or developers, they talk about technical aspect. Is it feasible? They forget about the other aspects. Ah, that's, yeah. My that's my awesome. vote, my vote for for what we had talked about in our breakout was that what we were discussing is you know I I feel like we felt like it wasn't feasible. Um, you know, from not not only from the standpoint of dollars, but from the standpoint of actually doing doing make creating the product safely. Mm. 
uh, what was your product that you were uh, discussing, Dave? Well, we were talking about like automated driving. And uh, I guess this goes back to um, what uh, Fernando was just saying. Uh, you know, so this automated driving technology, which they've sunk billions of dollars into, you know, as a previous software engineer, um, working on many systems uh i just don't believe it's possible to be able to cre create that system safely uh one of the examples that we we spoke of is what happens if you're in winter and you are in a whiteout conditions within a blizzard you literally if you know for for those of you who live in the northeast and you've been trapped in whiteout conditions where you can't see the left, the right, the front, or the back. You have no idea where your car is. You you see nothing. And I would love to see uh, even computer sensors be able to not only be able to relay that information correctly, but then having errorless code be able to navigate that vehicle. I don't think that it's possible. That was the type of things that we were discussing. So the feasibility. Yeah, that's a good example of the, the feasible part of the problem and, and also spilling over to ethical. You know, if we can't make it safe, should we make it? Well, I'm going to move us on now. Uh, so thank you for playing along. And I'm going to give you a little bit of thinking around product uh, that uh, I framed as as Thinking in bets. Now, a lot of my thinking around bets and product management comes from John Cutler. Uh, so if you actually follow up the slide deck later, I have some links to, to some of his articles around bets. Uh, but let's talk about thinking in bets. Let's consider for a moment some games, perhaps not card games, but coin games. Okay, two games. First game, it... Yes, thank you, Ken. John Cutler. Uh, $2 million to play. You get two coins and you win $10 million if you get two heads. Game two. You get $1 million per coin to play. You, you, that's what it costs you. You can toss up to two coins and you win $10 million if you get two heads. Now, I'm sure some of you can already see where this, where this is going, but let's go and do the math. So this is a, a probability analysis uh, to compute the expected value. And so this first game costs you $2 million to play. There are four possible outcomes. Tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, heads, heads. For three of those outcomes, you lose $2 million. And for one of those outcomes, you win $10 million. Uh, so your net is this, uh, what's in that second to last column. And then the way you compute expected value is you multiply that by the probability and you sum those up. So the half a million dollar expected value, if you played this game over and over and over and over and over again, you will average half a million dollar upside every time. Well, over time, that would, that would be your average. So that's game one. Game two. If we hit tails on coin one, we don't play again. We don't spend the second million dollars. So what's our expected value now? A million dollars. If we play this game over and over and over again, we'll average a million dollars upside. Which game would you rather play? Assuming you have deep enough pockets to keep throwing a million dollars at it. Game two. Two. It's like, okay, I'm going to keep playing that game. So, so the question we might ask is, how can we even further bias that game in our favor? What about game three? What if the first coin is only $1,000? And then to play the second coin, you know, if we play both coins, we're still at $2 million. But now our expected value is almost $1.5 million.
how is this like product development? Well, At least one of you mentioned this in the first discussion. Uh, we came up with our idea. We built it. We didn't get any feedback. We put it out in the market. Did we win? And if we didn't, whatever we invested, we've thrown that away. So thinking in bets, we're thinking, well, how can we cheaply do experiments to decide what to build. And even better, what happens if we iterate? So we have our idea, we have a cheap experiment, we learn something, we iterate an idea, we have a cheap experiment, and maybe eventually we've built something and we've won, and maybe we tossed our cards in. Uh, could we have a mute? Thank you. Uh, and maybe toss our cards in and fold. Okay, we can't win this particular game. We're, we're going to fold on it and go do something else. So coming, coming back to our notion of bets, what we're really going for here is how can we bias the game so that every one of those risks that you identified, for example, in your, uh, uh, your, your first exercise, what if you could find out for $100 in one day the answer to each one of those risks? So that might be our ideal. So how do we make our bets count better? We break them down into lots of small bets and then use those to iterate where we're going and fold early if, you know, if we, maybe we've spent a few thousand dollars instead of a few million dollars and decide, you know what, we're, we're, we're chasing the wrong rabbit. Let's go do something else. Or we spent a few thousand dollars and now we have a lot more confidence on our approach. Now let's keep iterating. So let's talk about a little bit about what's in our toolkit for doing those experiments. So one of the things in our toolkit, and this is really at the front end, is design thinking and human-centered design. And it's really answering that question of, is it desirable? And also answering the questions of, is it feasible? Is it viable? Is it ethical? Anna has thrown the MP MVP in the chat. Yes, an MVP, a minimum viable product, is one of our tools. And uh, one of the one of my inspirations in this world is uh, Lean Startup by Eric Rees, and I'm never confident I pronounce his name right. Uh, but the the true MVP is the thing that you could build very cheaply and easily to find out whether you're on the right track or not, and how to adjust. And he calls it pivot or persevere. Uh, one of my favorite stories out of his book uh, was the example of we want to build, we, we think the product is a recipe service. We, we're uh, targeting busy householders who don't have time to plan and shop for their meals, but would like to actually cook healthy meals. Well, what if at the beginning of the week we showed them uh, yeah, here's our recipe selection for the week. You, you check off which ones you want, and we'll have the groceries sh and the recipes shipped to your door, and then you, you just have to do the, the preparation and assembly on the night. You don't have to do all this upfront work of deciding what to make this week. And I, and I tell you from experience, when my wife and I sit down and decide, what are we going to cook this week? There are some weeks we're like, I wish somebody could make a decision for us. Um, so what was their MVP? They didn't even build a website. They sent a guy with a clipboard to people's homes. Now, there's a cheap experiment. They didn't even have to build something. They, well, what they built was, was you know, essentially a paper prototype. So that's one of the tools in our product discovery space. Uh, this diagram I borrowed from Pavel Huron on LinkedIn. Um, I encourage you to follow Pavel Huron because he has a lot of great content. 
Uh, what I will say about this double diamond of design thinking, it looks very linear, it's not. If you actually think it is a recipe and first you do this and then you do that and then you do the other thing and then you're done, uh, it's really a lot more nonlinear that, than that because at each point you're going to learn something, you're going to make a new decision. Oh, we're chasing the wrong problem. Let's go back. Or this solution really isn't going to pan out. Let's adjust. So that's one of the tools in our toolkit. Uh, another tool in our toolkit out of the human center design space uh, is there's a handbook here from the Luma Institute called Innovating for People. And I'm going to put on screen here, this is their website. And what uh, Luma Institute has done is they've, uh, if you read their blurb, they went and looked at hundreds of common practices for human centered design and problem solving. And they boiled down the most useful, in their opinion, 36. Uh, and for each of those, there's a little recipe. So for example, bullseye diagramming is a way of getting to uh, prioritizing something or buy a feature. Many of us in the Agile community will be familiar with buy a feature as a way of getting our stakeholders to decide where they want to invest our money. Uh, so each of these, there's a there's a guide, there's a hint. Uh, they have templates on Mural. Uh, there, I believe, they might also be templates on Miro. And then, if you want uh, want even more, uh, they also offer a variety of of learning programs. So there's a it's actually I think twelve or thirteen hundred dollars to do their initial Luma practitioner learning, uh, but. Uh, there's a lot of useful tools here, and they've also structured them in a set of uh, what they call recipes, as, along with an interactive guide uh, that helps you actually design. Well, you know, this is the problem we're trying to solve. This is the stakeholders I'm going to have, and they've got some suggested starting points. Oh, well, in order to do that, you might go do some interviewing, and then do some uh, persona profile and experience di diagramming to bring that together, uh, and then get into sort of uh, uh, abstraction laddering and make sure you're solving the right problem. I'll divert a little bit. Abstraction laddering is, is actually one of my favorite little tools because it asks whether you're solving the problem at the right abstraction level. So you go up and you ask, well, why are you solving that problem? Why are you solving that problem? That sort of gives you a broader and broader problem space you might be solving, but it also goes down and you say, how? How will I solve that problem? How will I solve that problem? How will I solve that problem? And that gives you uh, sort of more targeted solutions, potentially. Thanks for dropping that link in. So there's a link to Luma in the chat. All right, what else do we have? We also have, kind of obvious, prototypes and proof of concept. So in the technical space, we'll be very familiar with cobbling something together just to see, you know, could we make that work? Uh, I talked about lean startup and then commercial experiments. Uh, what, there's an example here if you follow that link. Uh, Sony, this is a few years ago, was running essentially a version of Kickstarter where they could do crowdfunding experiments on product ideas they had. And one of those was a, a smartwatch. So a commercial experiment, well, let's see. Let's let's see if enough people sign up on Kickstarter or some crowdfunding platform to actually decide whether we should do this. You know, if if three people sign up, okay, there's not an interest. If we get overwhelmed with requests at whatever we put in there, oh, it's probably worth doing something. So these are some places we might look. All right, now a next tool in our toolkit, we're gonna to go back to Miro. Uh, and we'll keep you in the same groups. And here's where we're going. So you did a part one. Part one was risks, assumptions, and hypotheses. Part two is an experiment canvas. So choose one of your risks. Doesn't matter which one. 
and use the experiment canvas as a way of exploring what experiment might we do to, I will drop that link, yes, what experiment might we do to determine whether or not we should continue or not, or you know, assess that risk, that hypothesis. What questions do you have before I send you back to the groups? How much time do you want with this one? Let's do, looking at the time. Let's do eight. No, actually, we could do 10 minutes in the group. And if you if you get done with one experiment, uh, you know, maybe change some, color, some sticky colors and do a second one. But uh, I'm guessing you'll have a pretty good discussion in about 10 minutes. Okay. Go ahead and open the rooms now. All right. Questions? All right. Have at it. Have fun. It was fun. It was fun? All right. It, oh, yeah. Say more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What was fun about it? Um, well, I mean, everything was fun. I really liked especially the results because our challenge was to safety. We chose safety risk. And our challenge was how do we create an electric flying electric vehicle that is safe? And so we came up with a hypothesis and we came up with a, what is the result of our experiment that would convince the insurance company that our vehicle is safe. Mm -hmm. And we said that if the experiment uh, kills less than five people, then it proves successful. And then there's the other problem of convincing people that they want to own, buy and own this. <laughs> not, not, for the five, not for the five people. <laughs> not for you, those five. You don't, have, yeah. you don't have to convince them. Yes, okay. I see we've gone to the dark <laughs> side now. <laughs> yeah. All right. What else? Somebody else. Maybe some other room. Yeah. We already yeah. Uh, shared uh, last time. You know, so for our group, we were also looking at the electric car, but that can go up to a thousand miles um, before a recharge, and then the recharge can be done uh, within one hour. And um, I think for our hypothesis, we. Uh, we thought, yeah, if the engineers or the scientists would build a new electric car, maybe using several battery system, and that will be the charging time will be fast enough that uh, because the drivers uh, do not want to wait too long. For it. And then we thought the scientists to make this happen, this experiment would be all the electrical engineers, chemical engineers, uh, mechanical materials, and uh, probably uh, um, just regular people to understand how it would work. Right, so what was the experience like of using the experiment canvas? Yeah, what do you say, Jita? How did you like it? I was going to say, I think because of visually, it just gives you a lot of opportunity to experiment it. And it's like, oh, it's like sky is the limit. You have to have, you have to um, like hone down your thought process a little bit uh, because I think there is a lot of room to go wild but then again, you have to do a reality check and, you know, focus and that on the target areas. Like, you know, that's what happens when you have a lot of um, a big space to work with. 
I like how you are putting it. I, I, I agree. Same as previously. I really like that the framework is quite strict and yes. the time frame is really demanding. This is something that should be incorporated in uh, corporate meetings, definitely. Yeah, I think you have that big canvas, like you said, and then you have these focusing ideas that you really have to bring your thoughts to. So I think those uh, the graphic organizers helped us to revisit what we were discussing. I think right. this is one, one way of, uh, it's one tool that you can use to bring out uh, various ways of writing requirements. However, what I will say is, and I've seen this many times, uh, the idea of the requirements is very important from the standpoint of, you know, many times, you know, in a user story in JIRA, the PO may write requirements that are positive, but yet they don't focus on negative requirements or even one negative requirement, right? I mean, if we were to all write code, it's pretty easy to write the positive case, but if you don't consider the negative cases, your code is definitely not complete and all kinds of things can go haywire. Um, like if you are not catching errors in your code, right? Yeah, I mean, even just basic exception handling. If you don't put an mm -hmm. exception handler in there, right, your 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 code's gonna, you know, do a divide by zero, you're gonna crash. And uh, you know, who knows what happens at that point? Your car goes <laughs> off the road, I guess. Yeah. Great, and, great comparison. And and something something I would suggest is that there's more than one way to use the experiment canvas. So as you've uh, outlined there, you know, you can use it as a way of finding the negative requirements for what you're gonna build. Uh, but the other is what are the cheap experiments you can do, not so much in terms of the negative requirements, but in terms of finding out what's possible or finding out what the market wants, finding out if we're solving a real person's problem. Um, so more than, more than one place to apply that. Uh, I also put in the chat, uh, if you're not familiar, there's a company called Strategizer, and they have a lot of interesting articles and canvases that are that are also useful in this space. Uh, the one I've linked to there is a, a, a very simple one for designing experiments. Uh, so that's just another resource for you. Uh, somebody else, what, what was what was helpful like about the experience? Well, I wanted to add that, you know, if you're if you're finding that, you know, something is, you know, the negative parts not included, you know, or not considered, then somewhere along the line, the user story or the user, one or more of the user stories, perhaps that comprise a use case, haven't been adequately vetted because there is they're not the you, the success criteria are, are not fully considered and defined because some, those should have been picked up before you had. Certainly, it's before code's gone out the door. It's well, before, if not done, picked up during testing, you know, uh, QA and then user acceptance testing. It would have even been before that, before when you're testing the, you know, uh, you know, uh, the testing in the, within the department before you roll it out, you know, before you're doing a proof of concept. Somewhere along the line, this is a matter of, you know, who is vetting and considering the processes that are defined, the use case themselves, the user stories, and saying, we're not done here. And that it comes back to the product owner and the lead business analyst in an earlier iteration of these roles. But in the meantime, it also comes back to, you know, developers saying, this isn't done. Going back to that product owner and saying that too. Right. So so here we're talking about implementation risk, right, of, of uh, understanding what done looks like. Exactly. So, yeah. So that that's one of our certainly one of our risks is that implementation risk. Um, or as uh, uh, the can canvas gave us some yeah. kind of uh, you know value stream mapping. Uh, seeing uh, we uh, it's basically an assumption saying that we're going to do these set of things and see whether we can come up with something which is viable. So we had the same uh, thing. We had the EV with the thousand range uh, vehicle. Or looking at the technology, how long it's going to take a developer technology. So I think the the canvas kind of helped us focus, and although we didn't cover all the aspects of the canvas within the given time frame. Sure. Yeah. So a t a tool that hopefully you 
could take away and find useful. Did anybody else have a different experience or something else to add about how it was to attempt to fill out an experiment canvas? Andrea, what about you? Did you have any uh, thoughts you would like to share with the rest? Well, no new thought is that having to brainstorm several of us around the same topic. I mean, we had to refine our the test we wanted to run and the hypothesis we wanted to have. So it was very powerful to be working together on the same a whiteboard, if I may say, uh, and also have a time limitation. Uh, it, in real life, it may not be eight minutes, but yes, at one point you need to wrap up and move on. Sure. I also think um, not having an SME, um, like among us, we were just, um, just you know, it was like a fine, fun approach for us, but someone with the actual know-how would probably have a better insight. I mean, that's, um, everybody knows that. I'm just stating the obvious, but I just feel like in a real life situation, the discussions would be much different and we would act, have a, have an actual outcome. Um, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's, that's a good reminder. I mean, I make sure we have the right people in the discussion. Exactly, it's the right yeah. stakeholders, yeah. yes. Some of this with the stakeholders, uh, some of this may be included. This is sort of like, I, I believe, like top to bottom, but you really need good, really good leadership at the top because if you, especially if the larger the organization, the more it's going to be very costly uh, to go down wrong paths. And if you're talking about like having something designed, a product made, and that product already exists and maybe it's already better in the market. I mean, why would you even go down the road of even considering to work on that product? And yet I'm sure every day, all of us knows, uh, you know, especially if you work for a large organization where, you know, you yourself know, wow, this, this product already exists. Why are we doing this? Um, and so it really all starts at the top, in my opinion, with, with having good leadership um, because otherwise you're just wasting a lot of time and wasting a lot of money. And it's just sort of delaying the inevitable, maybe pick another product, maybe, maybe pick something like in the same space, but a different product where nobody's going after that. And, and you've really pointed Dave to a, a, an aspect of agility at the enterprise level is so much agility is really about dealing with what is rather than what you wish is um and so actually there's, there's a leader i know of who is promoting the book reality-based leadership uh and if i ken's probably googling the link now to paste it in the chat thank you ken um by cy wakeman and that that you know can everybody in the value chain everybody in the leadership hierarchy hear truth and when you have somebody in the organization who can't hear truth, but they're in a position of power, sometimes that creates a stuck point. So reality-based leadership. All right, I'm gonna take us on to our final piece and point us to a couple of ways of organizing this work. Uh, so one of those is called dual track development. This is from Jeff Patton. Uh, there's a link in the bottom to, to an article where he talks about dual track development. But the essence there is you, there's two kinds of work being done. And one kind of work is really the early experiments, the discovery, the finding out, are we solving the right problem? Are we solving it in the right way? Can our customers use this? Um, is it feasible? You know, some of those experiments are technical experiments. And then in the meantime, you're doing uh, actual value development delivery, uh, the actual development work. And if you're doing it in an agile way, you're, you're creating uh, usable increments of value, something you can put in front of, in front of somebody and get feedback uh, for a real product 
along the way. So this is very much a, a software way of looking at the world and, and, the, and the two kinds of work that are being done. I'm, I'm curious if any of you are doing or have, have experience in the dual track development. Not hearing any inputs, we'll move to the so other are, one. Are we, oh, are we talking ahead. about sort of like, uh, you know, operations, value streams and development value streams here i mean is that is that kind of where you're going with this well where where jeff Petten goes with this is uh the notion of a single team and maybe that's it could be a team of teams uh but you're doing the work in this upper stream let me put the pointer on it in this upper, upper stream you're doing the experiments like uh oh we think we think the next feature in our product should be uh, a generative AI tool for creating uh, content in PowerPoint. Well, would anybody use that? How could we prototype that in a way that's really cheap and see if people actually like it? So maybe we do a little experiment and then maybe that experiment makes its way into the product. Well, what's the next experiment? Well, you know, maybe we think that... Uh, we also want that generative AI to, to generate images. Maybe we put that into PowerPoint too. Well, let's do a little experiment, find out whether that's a useful thing for people or whether we could build that. Oh, that experiment says, no, let's put that one in the bin, forget that one. Uh, so you're, you're answering the question of what should we build? And along the way, you're actually also building and delivering value. And some of those things actually create feedback that go back. Uh, this model is not applicable to every kind of product development. It's one way of organizing. Well, I mean, so you can do prototypes um, as, as you know, spikes in, within your sprints to discover some of this stuff. But at the same time, you also need people at the top of, you know, if you're going to scale this, maybe at the portfolio level or capability level that, uh, you know, has some understanding of, what is wanted you know by the customer i mean you have to start somewhere you can't just hand it all to the to the at the team level i mean they have to start with something so yeah and that, maybe, and maybe that, as you, the, maybe and as that you comes to how do you organize how do you organize your teams around this kind of work um not all work is scalable down to a team can do it and then yes you you've got this going on at multiple levels, for example, there's a portfolio level that's, that's thinking about this. So, uh, well, I mean, you could you could scale it any way you wanted. I mean, you yeah. know, uh, that that's pretty much like open, you know, to however. I mean, you can have one product and then break everything up into subsystems and scale it that way, and each team is a subsystem. Or, you know, I mean, there's many ways to scale. There, there are many ways to scale. Exactly. So I'm, I'm not attempting to solve that problem for you. <laughs> uh, but the thought being, there's two kinds of work: discovery and development, and they happen in parallel. Jeff Patton's argument is, if you can do that on a single team, great. It'll, you'll be able to move really fast at deciding what to do. There are some things you can't do on a single team, and then you have. To I scale. actually, I actually came up with this idea of running um, two separate teams, let's say for a product and running one team where the first team would write the requirements and the second team would be the development team and the requirements would run a sprint ahead. So the requirements team would maybe be running like prototypes or maybe the developers would help with the prototypes and, and start kicking out a sprint ahead some uh user stories with requirements in them and then for the next sprint the development team would then work on those requirements so they're always a sprint ahead with what was needed yeah that's, that's, that is another way of organizing those those two threads of work uh one other resource i'll point you to and i'm really new to this is something i haven't uh spent much time in is uh continuous discovery uh so the 
uh, Teresa Torres has quite a bit in this space. And I see Nawaz has a hand up. Uh, sorry, I was late. <laughs> uh, I was I was on the dual track. Yeah, yeah, I I did have some experience there. So two ways I have seen it work. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, one of the team that I work with was uh, a small uh, and a low code environment team. So they actually had a low code environment. So they were doing a website development. And uh, they have uh, like their business partners and, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, UI work that need to happen. Um, so what we uh, did uh, with that team was to construct uh, with the same team, a design and a development sprint. So the whole idea was to offset the design sprint from the development sprint by one week. And uh, what they were doing was like, they were running both things, both sprint at the same time, but effectively, uh, the design sprint was leading, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the development sprint. So uh, they were sorting out all their UX and UI, right? The, the designs and the blueprints and all of that in their design sprints. And they were trying to bake those designs to a certain level of detail. So when it comes for the development sprint, it's, it, it probably meets their definition of ready enough to for them to actually take on that work. So that was one, one experience uh, on this dual track. The other one was done uh, uh, when we could not have a cross-functional team. So there was not enough uh, critical mass in the organization to have UX designers, mm. right? To scale them across all the squads. So we had four, we have four squads and they could not have the UX uh, capability built into those squads. So we what we did, we actually stand up a UX squad. So, and we brought people from outside, right? And then the whole idea was to actually offset again the design sprint from the development sprint by one sprint. And this time it was a two week sprint. And what we were trying to do with the UX work was to look at uh, like all the sketching and baking, right? Uh, creating a golden path, uh, socializing, right? Uh, the wireframes and uh, and the blueprint to a certain level of details uh, that uh, we are actually ready uh, uh, for us to go and implement those designs. So while the teams were doing uh, the the UX, uh, like the design sprints, uh, they had uh, development team highly engaged. So we were creating low fidelity, right, prototypes and all that in the in the design sprints, and then we were taking them for the for the for the development sprints. Uh, so yeah, so I mean these two situations, I I've seen it work. Uh, cool. Yeah. That's a yeah. Multiple multiple ways to organize it. Multiple ways to split it out. Um. So yeah, I was mentioning continuous discovery. This is fairly new to me. It's something I want to learn more about. Uh. And then one other tool in your toolkit is the risk adjusted backlog. So your backlog for development is often organized, hopefully organized by the most valuable things first. Uh, but you might do something like a risk likelihood impact matrix and then decide, well, what items are we going to put in our backlog in order to uh, mitigate or account for or experiment around the risks? And uh, actually, some of those experiments might tell you, oh, well, actually, we don't need to build three, four, and five because experiment one told us they're not needed. Uh, and far better to find it early that we don't need to build something, then actually build it and then find out we didn't need to build it. Yeah, so that that risk item that you're talking about, so that that in, in my experience would really be like a spike in a sprint, basically. Yeah. So you'd have a bunch of developers trying to go test something or prototype something and then sort of report back to the team probably at a daily scrum, like just some basic information as to whether it worked or not or, you know, more information uh and then uh then maybe take take it further with inserting it into a sprint if it was successful uh to do the real work yeah and and that uh and what you've described sounds to me a lot like sort of the technical experiment side so that's on the feasible circle uh but those risk items could also be on the desirable and viable you know maybe it's the commercial experiment or the uh paper prototype with an actual user and, and see what that is. So yes, 
putting putting it in the sprint, you could call it a spike. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, they can run scrum at the, you know, the business can run scrum. Anybody can scrum anything. Uh, I, I find, you know, in order for any of these organizations to be successful at the very top of it, if your leadership is not agile, uh, that can present some serious problems. Yeah. Uh, I will point you to this article as well. Uh, the this particular blog item has some interesting thoughts around the commercial aspects of the risk adjusted backlog and including opportunities as well. So found that to be an interesting article. All right, let's wrap this up. Uh, so guess what? Number one takeaway, product development is risky. Our theories are wrong. Our theories about what customers want, about what we can create a successful product from. Every move we make is a bet. If we put this money in, we'll get some outcome. But we can choose our bets to improve our outcomes. And our, our experiments, our discovery cycles, our spikes, those are all ways to move those decisions upstream earlier, cheaper, so we find out early the places we're wrong and we can adapt based on that information. All right. That's all I've got for you. Uh, I'm happy to do any Q&A or can if you have any other final announcements before we wrap. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew, for doing this. We really appreciate it. I hope folks got a lot of value out of it. It looks like we, it sounds like we did, which is, you know, I love the engagement. Yeah, I love the discussion. Thank you. It's great. People had yeah, some great ideas to, to add yeah. to this. I learned some things today too. So awesome. Yeah, I uh, really appreciate also our um, co-organizers here, Fernando, Natalie, Andrea, I really appreciate the effort that you folks put in to doing this as well. And attendees, uh, if you like what you've seen here, um, if you you know like the kind of stuff that Princeton Agility does, feel free to call us out on social media as well. Um, our next session is on uh, October 22nd. We're going to be doing a lean coffee session there. So, you know, feel free to join us then. We can maybe do some deeper discussions on some of the things that we've talked about here or whatever you bring to the conversation. So uh, December and January, we're still kind of organizing around what we're going to do there. Um, I'm going to be doing something with Dave McKenna in December. I think that's where we're landing. And we're talking about potentially doing a panel discussion um, first quarter of next year on the future of agility. We'll have to see. Oh, Natalie, what did you guy? Did I get the date wrong there? Yeah, the 25th. You're right. I apologize. I put October 22nd. It's supposed to be October 25th. So uh, um, for the next session, for um, the next lean coffee that we're going to be doing. So um, that's all we got for you. I hope uh, everybody enjoys the rest of their evening. And again, please feel free to call us out or rate us on. Um, meet up as well. I thank right. you also from me, guys, to you who actively participated. It's really always a pleasure to hear people speaking up. Uh, really great pleasure. Chita, Vani, Dave, um, Navaz, Ibanga, thank you guys. Gary, thank you so much for Paul, of course. I consider yourself uh, our own <laughs> Paul. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, uh, for such participation. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. It was great, like, working with everybody and uh, gaining experience. I actually had a follow-up question for Ken, and uh, we don't have to discuss it now, maybe offline in an email. Uh, do any of these uh, count towards uh, getting our PDUs to maintain cert? A very selfish question. I don't know about PDUs. I haven't really, I don't know what's involved or required with, um, PMI regarding PDUs. I can tell you SEUs, absolutely. Um, uh, yes, I know about PDUs. And yes, you can report that. Oh, perfect. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to see how much um, this will um, equal to, but overall, the discussions are super helpful. Yeah. Uh, um, Fernando, SEUs sorry. are, are scrum education units. So those are for renewing your. Mm -hmm. Scrum master, product owner, that kind of thing is through Scrum Alliance. I'm sorry, go ahead, Gary, go ahead. Uh, no, 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 I was just uh, clarifying with Fernando. This also qualifies for PDUs, the, the project management stuff? Yeah, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's good to know. Mm-hmm. But you you need to copy the link. You need to report the link to the event. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Mm -hmm. you. What Thank are the questions you, everyone. do we have before we what are the questions do we have before we wrap up? Anything else? Good day, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one. Hope Thank to you. see you again. Thanks, Bye. Andrew. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.